Hello there, you're very welcome to The Breakdown on the Racing Post Digital Channels in association with Ladbrokes for weekend two of the Guinness Six Nations and what a tournament it has been to start with. We're going to try and guide you through the three games this weekend and see if we can find some value for you in the market and decide what might happen and where. And to do that, I'm joined by Dominic Ryan, former Irish international Leicester and Leinster back row, and also by Nicola McGeady, the head of public relations with Ladbrokes. You're both very, very welcome indeed. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Dominic, let me start with you. Life on this side of the white line, how is it in <laughs> yeah, your retirement? I mean, um, the first few months would have been challenging enough. Uh, there's a lot of things you suppose you miss, the crack with the lads and that kind of stuff, but uh, I'm enjoying waking up on a Sunday, Monday morning and being able to kind of fluidly walk you know, down the stairs in the morning, not having been beat up the night before. So, um, I look, there's, life suppose, has to go on in some ways and uh, it was unfortunate the way things ended early, but as I said, you know, trying to get things in order for, for, for my next stage. Yeah, well, you're healthy and well. Healthy and well, which is important. Most yeah. important. <laughs> Speaking of healthy and well, or maybe not feeling so well on Monday morning, Irish side, well and truly beaten up by England. Were you yeah. surprised by that? When I initially saw the teams line up last week, I thought, you know, Eddie had been speaking about bringing a team to specifically beat Ireland and, um, you know, Ireland, Ireland team have a lot of physical carriers, you know, uh, CJ Stander, you got Tyg Furlong, you know, Bundyaki in the centre as well. But every time one of those guys carried the ball, they just had, you know, a bigger player on the other side just knocking them back. And unfortunately, getting go forward ball is a huge part of playing rugby and playing, you know, executing a game plan well. And they just never got a chance to get into the game. And yeah, I heard an ex-international, an England international, saying everybody knows what Ireland are going to do, but no one's been able to come up with a blueprint to stop it. England did yeah. that. They well, just I mean, cut Ireland off in the backfield. It seemed it seemed so obvious after seeing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, you know, they hit twelve either out the back or they cut, go out the back of the twelve to you know to, to Gary, and they just you know they play wide. But as soon as it, kind of England went and did it and just shut them down, I mean, it, it's a quality defence. That you have to have to be able to defend against, you know, attack like that, and to have the confidence to do that, particularly in the wider channels. You know, where the thirteen has to link up with the fifteen, and you know, not leaving enough space for them to exploit the, those gaps like teams have done in the past. Yeah. But I think the, the defensive tactic that England came with last weekend was just it was a masterclass in defence. And then took their opportunities, and, and you have to admire the way that England plays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Manu, physical. I mean. I thought they used Manu very cleverly last week because a lot of people would have thought you know they were just going to crash him up, use him as that physical twelve. But from having played with him in Leicester, he's got that physical element to his game, but he's also got a huge amount. Like his ball handling skills are absolutely world class. Mm. Um, it's probably it sounds funny saying that you know he's playing twelve for England, but his ball handling <coughs> skills are as good as I've ever seen. Um, and they used him as that kind of ball playing role where you mm. know. They, they ran him short to hold down uh, Bundy and Gary in the centre. They went out the back to Slade and they played wide to you know, Jack Noel on the wings. and They exploited gaps there maybe that people hadn't done in the past. But as I said, the great thing about Manu is he's got that versatility. He's a ball handling player, but he can also crash it up if it needs be. And you know, with, the, with, the, with the playmaking skills of Slade at 13, they just they kind of carved Ireland up. Nicola, from your perspective, with your professional head on, it was a good weekend from your perspective to see the, to see the favourites knocked back, right? It was. I mean, it's very hard to cheer with your professional hat on when you are <laughs> Irish and I was in a bar surrounded by English people, so it was disappointing. But uh, there was such a change in the betting. Obviously, Ireland went into the tournament red-hot favourites, really well backed. But now it's England who are odds on four to six favourites and that has emerged really popular. Obviously Ireland's hopes of a title are still alive. Grand Slam hopes, no, but they're six to one. Not many people backing that. But I have to say for a silver lining for Ireland, they are known to be slow starters in mm. the Six Nations and get stronger as the tournament progress. So I'm not writing them off altogether. But Wales, they looked good in their comeback yeah. against France. We can see them as second favourites at 11 to four. And then after that, nobody tends to show much interest in yeah. the other teams betting wise. <laughs> Well, well, let's let's talk about Wales and France because when you when you look back to what happened, I mentioned it to Stephen Ferris last week. France are mentally fragile and and have have seemed to get more and more fragile as each season goes by. But to have a sixteen point turnaround at home, yeah, it's what? not it's not all, very often done in uh, you know international rugby. Oof. And I think you know uh, the French may come with a bit of an arrogance or a bit of a um, cockiness maybe to things and uh, they went in you know 16 points well 13 points at half time and extended up to 16 and you know maybe they came out in the second half thinking the job was done and you can't do that in international rugby particularly against Wales who have 
I suppose they were they were gifted fourteen points to a degree, but um, look, they really should have finished that game out. Yeah, and, and and a word also then on Scotland and Italy quickly on that. Maybe maybe Italy doing a little bit better when they when when they were when the gap was there and you felt that Scotland might just disappear out the gate. Italy found a way of getting themselves back in and actually beating the spread. Yeah, well, a, a few people were saying to me, funny enough, of the spread, I said, uh, you know, they're saying twenty three points. That's a lot, and. Um, I said, yeah, but Italy will fade in the second half. And I remember getting a few texts at halftime saying, oh, you know, that minus 23 isn't looking great. I said, ah, don't worry, you know, they'll fade. And it was looking that way for quite a large yeah, portion kind of of the second half. And then, you know, maybe that kind of cockiness set in again and they kind of switched off, thought the job was done. But mm. Italy have some dangerous backs as well. And they, they do. And we'll come on to what they, what they might do this weekend in a minute. But before we finish out this segment, let's have a look at the Grand Slam because mm. they're... A couple of live contenders again, obviously England, Wales and Scotland and, 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 and maybe the value, well, I was going to say is the value in a no Grand Slam, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. As you said, no Grand Slam is still favoured at four to five. But actually the one the punters seem to be piling into is Wales yeah. after that victory. I think that really looks the value at five to four, yeah. England seven to four and 25 to one bars. Like you're Scotland. thinking if they can beat England, which would be a, a tall task, it's really just Ireland. You know, yeah. that, well, no, that's taken for granted. They beat Scotland and uh, Italy also. But I mean, <coughs> if they can get past England, all of a sudden now you're probably talking... A well, they've won 10 in a row and, and they're, they're looking good, made major changes for this weekend and we'll come on to those in, in, in just a couple of minutes. But let's take the games this weekend in order and start with Ireland and Scotland. First up at a quarter past two on Saturday afternoon in Murrayfield. Ireland, everybody says, will, must, have to bounce back. There's the team that, that Joe Schmidt has picked. Five changes, Quinn Rue in the second row. In the back row, Jack Conan and Sean O'Brien in. And then in that back line, Chris Farrell starts at 13 with Rob Carney back at 15. Th that's a lot of changes. You've been in, in both international and, and, and Champions Cup teams where, where changes happen. How big an adjustment is that in a, in a six-day to seven-day turnaround? Yeah, I mean, you look at the team. They've, they, most of those players were probably in camp the previous week, so they're getting a sense of what's going on. So, you know, Joe's mantra will be, you know, anyone should be able to slot in kind of at any point. Yeah, it. but that's the mantra. How real is that? Is it's quite real, particularly okay. under Joe as well. I mean, he, he's, he's one of the best coaches in the world for a reason. That's because he can get all players, you know, throughout the whole 40-man squad, you know, ready. And he expects you to be ready if there is, you know, a last-minute injury that you can slot into the team. And to be honest, it is pretty real in the Irish mm -hmm. setup. Um, you've got Shawnee coming back in at seven. Um, the thought there you would have, would believe is just that that go forward ball that yeah. Ireland so badly struggled with. O'Brien is yeah. going to bring that. And Jack's going to bring it as well. I mean, Jack. I mean, the whole way up since he's a young lad, he's just physically he's a huge he's a huge guy, um, and he can just one of those players who's just going to get you, you know, beat the first defender, get you through a hole, get your front foot ball, which we so much needed, you know, that we lacked last weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, Chris Farrell's been impressive when he has when he has yeah, played, and uh, he's really struggled with injury. But another huge opportunity for again, him. Yeah, another really physical, uh, re really physical addition to that back line. You know, you got Bundy and Farrell in the centre. You have Rob coming back in the full back. You know, I think on, in the conditions last last week, uh, Henshaw was maybe a little bit exposed, but at the same time, he played well. He did play well. Um, well, you can't buy experience and you can't buy positional well, sense and that's Rob's why Rob's back, is back. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and you turn over and you look at, at, at the Scottish side and they have some, some experience coming back. It's really, really hard on Blair Kinghorn having scored yeah. three tries last week and leading the market in terms of, yeah. of, of tries scored for the, for the championship. For him to get dropped and back yeah. in though comes Sean Maitland, Johnny Gray into the second row. That's a really balanced looking Scottish side, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I mean, it, it's unfortunately for Kinghorn to be dropped. but look <laughs> On the bench, but... He, well, yeah. dropped off the... 15, you know, absolutely. Dropped, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got Maitland coming in, a, you know, in his, in his boots and he's going he's gonna to probably put on a similar show, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got Toulouse on the bench. He's been playing incredible all season. And, and we were speaking earlier about, you know, maybe Scotland didn't have that depth, but... You know, with someone like Kinghorn on the bench to come in in the backs, and you've got Toulouse, you know, as a second row to, to add a lot of kind of physicality in, in late in the second half. You know, maybe they do have a bit, bit more depth than they used to. Well, before I ask you how you see this one, how do you see this one? Well, I'll just quickly talk you through first try score because it's always a very popular market. Every time Stockdale got the ball last week, the crowd lifted and there was this huge expectation on him to deliver. He's going to be around 11-2 to to score for us, mainly due to his club form and all the tries he scored in the competition last year. 
at a bigger price selection, I think Keane Healy might be a little bit popular. He scored last, last week. week, yeah. And again, people kind of forget them? about him. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I thought it was held up. <laughs> 25 to 1 might be a bit of value. If we're looking at Scotland, Stuart Hogg, Tommy Seymour, we expect them to be popular amongst the Scottish fans. Um, but outright betting, Ireland get very much are expected to have the class to see this one through. On paper, they're the second best team in the world. Uh, and we very much are already seeing money coming in for them. They're priced at two to five. Scotland are two to one. Scotland are two to one. I actually think that's value. And sim oh. also Murrayfield's yeah. not a very good, happy hunting ground recently for Ireland. I think they've lost uh, two on the, of their last three visits yeah. here. Well, I've put my money where my mouth is a few quid on Scotland. But uh, no, we'll have to see. I think, you know, as the betting kind of continues, I reckon that spread will push out maybe to kind of minus seven, which I think yeah. will give you an opportunity on the other half. I, I personally fancy, you know, Scotland, they looked good last week, apart from, you know, they switched off in the last 20 minutes, but I think plus seven at home is, uh, it's it's It's, it's going to be, by all accounts, a dirty, blustery, yeah. horrible Always afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, but, but particularly yeah, dirty yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and blustery afternoon. Does, does that play in either side's advantage? Do you see that in either side's advantage? Or is I mean, it just a great leveller? You know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I. I mean, if there's the, you, know, you have an unders markets, I'm sure. But I think yeah. you know it could be one of those games where, as you said, it's a dirty kind of bruising game, and I don't know if it's going to be a high scoring game, um, mm. an unders market, and that's why you know that kind of reinforces the decision for for back in the plus. You know, uh, mm. the plus six. As I said, I think it will be quite low scoring. So. Um, Okay, well, put but you 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 have put your money where your mouth is. You're expecting Scotland to win this to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. They could win it. Come on, I, I don't the job is call it. The job is call it. Job is call it. I'll go. I'll go with the value and take Scotland. Take you Scotland. Pay it. Say I want to say Scotland to cover the handicap, the right. six point handicap as it stands. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I I expect Ireland to bounce back here. I think, I think that the, there's too much in the tank over the last eighteen months. I think they are badly, badly stung. And and what's going to be really interesting is, have they learned the lessons of what happened last week? Mm. And for me, they have. So. I'm, I'm going to stick with Ireland on that one. Right, let's move on to, uh, to Italy and Wales. Uh, at, uh, I think it's a quarter to five on Saturday afternoon. And this is a, a, an interesting one for a number of reasons. Wales, 10 wins in a row. They've made 10 changes going into this game against Italy. Some will describe that as disrespectful. Having said that, building towards a World Cup, knowing that f factually Italy are the weakest side in the competition and Wales should have enough it's a pretty decent place for, for, for Warren Gatlin to test his side, isn't it? Yeah, well, I and mean... his depth. Ladbrokes have obviously thought that was disrespectful. They've, they've brought the spread in from minus 20 to minus 17. Uh, I'd probably still be siding with the minus 17, despite, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a weaker team maybe than, than most people expected. Mm. Um, I think Italy are really, really struggling. They seem to be in a rut. You know, Conor Shea's under a lot of pressure. They did show some moments of brilliance last week, but... I think, you know, the Welsh team just has better depth. And even though they've made 10 changes, still got bigger there. They got Alla Davies at 10. Mm. You know, they still have a lot of experience in the pack. Um, and I still, I, I'd, ba I'd be back in Wales to cover that spread. Yeah, Jonathan Davies takes over as captain, his first time as captain. A lot of, a lot of talk around that Davis bigger 9-10 combination. And you look at, at the established sides going to the World Cup. You look at Ireland, you look at New Zealand, you look at Scotland, you look at England, and you have a sense that, they know, their coaches know, in fact, it's very clear who their best halfback partnership is, if all fit. I'm not sure that Wales have decided that, are you? I think, personally, I think Gatlin didn't want to let Bigger stroll back into the team, seeing as the, he's playing with a, an English club, and he's playing with Northampton, um, and he wants to maybe put down a marker that you can't play for an English club and walk back into the Welsh team. But I think, undoubtedly, their best partnership is Gareth Davies at nine, and bigger at ten, but mm. as I said, you know, Gareth Anscombe well, went quite well last weekend. Um, I think bigger will be starting for the rest of the tournament, provided he's injury free. Okay, let's have, have one last quick check on on the Italian side because you've you've got to look at Campagnaro moving into thirteen from the wing. It's probably his better position. It's where he burst onto the international scene mm. a number of years ago. That might do something to shore up the defence again. You look at the you look at the at the great Sergio Parise, and you wonder wonder how he keeps going <laughs> when he's taken all those defeats. Fantastic servant to Italian rugby. But but can you see any way that Italy, that Italian side, can can give Wales anything approaching a game? Approaching a game, maybe up until half time. So if we can get a half time handicap or something like that, you know, <laughs> we can get something oh, around eight, eight or nine points. Yeah. 
Could do it, yeah. Okay, well, what's the match betting on this one looking like? Yeah, listen, as you said, Wales are on this unbelievable uh, winning streak and Gatlin said they've forgotten how to lose nearly. That's very much reflected in their price at 1-14. to This is the perfect opportunity for them in Rome to try out the squad. They've no fresh injury worries. So, yeah, it'll be the handicap market that's really popular. Um, Wales are going to be back to cover that handicap market. Italy have just been dismal. We've got no kind of faith in them after what we've seen last weekend. They're priced at 7-1. to one. If you're looking at first try scorer betting, um, if we're looking at Italy, at, at, actually, Campanaro is going to be quite popular, I think. He's 14-1 to one to score the first try and 2-1 to one any time. And I think he'll be popular, especially if people think Italy will start off from where they finished last week, where they, did, they scored 17 points um, in the second half against Scotland. So I think that might be a little bit of value. Mm. Okay, well, to one, I like that. Yeah. Campanaro any time. That's yeah, not I'm not convinced. Well, yeah. I am convinced by is that I think Italy are going to be good again. I think I think last week I, I said I didn't think that the spread was 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 fair to them, and I don't mm. think the spread is fair to them. Having particularly seen that Welsh side, yeah. I think that Welsh side is going to be asked. Yes, they'll win, but 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 being asked to gel in a meaningful way to, and. and Italy at home for the first time this season. I fancy Italy at that 17 points. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll have a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one of those ones. I mean, I thought plus 20 or plus 34 points against New Zealand in November was, you know, a, a very fair price. Um, but then you end up backing it and they end up getting beaten by 67 nil. 36 or something at half time. Yeah, and you turn around to yourself and you say, you know, why do, I, I, why do I get caught out again? <laughs> you know, the obvious choice was New Zealand. But um, look, that's probably why I'd side with the minus 17 against your, your thought of the plus. But okay, we'll see. We'll see. Let's go to, to game three on Sunday, England and France. And I guess from, from a neutral perspective, this is probably uh, uh, the one to, to look forward to most. I simply cannot understand what has happened to French rugby. You saw in the first 40 minutes again on last weekend just how good they can be. And yet... They implode. They imploded against Fiji. They, are, they have a history of imploding. And yet the talent is there. Have you any sense from a player's perspective what goes on out I there? I think it's just complacency. And another big thing that I've learned from you know, a few of my close colleagues and fellow players going away to play in France is that it, it's, not just a, it, it's a problem that's deeply rooted in French rugby, I think. Um, there's a certain element of there's a lack of professionalism and there's a certain just kind of French way of doing things. From having been in Leinster and Leicester, it's very process driven, it's very, very professional. And their approach to training, maybe recovery and all that kind of stuff, even you know, gym work and fitness is a little bit old school. Mm. And I think that's being reflected, you know, in the in the in the lack of performance in the national side. And it was definitely, as I said, made more prevalent to me having close friends who played for, you know, Bordeaux and Racing Metro and understanding, I suppose, the standards that are expected at club level and ultimately if it's not being driven day in, day out at club level, it's very tough to you know, emulate a really high professional, high performing environment at international level. Uh, I'm just interested, are people backing France? No, not at all. I mean, no, the way they imploded them, right? against Wales, they're 9-2. to two, And even though there's no love loss between these sides, we're definitely not yeah. expecting a close game. And the line has actually moved from England. Plus, uh, England have gone out from 9 to 13 in the handicap market. So we're going to be happy to lay France all day on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, when, when you... When you when you follow your logic through and France face England, there's a, there, there will be a respect, maybe a fear there. That's and that, it. that is, I'm trying to grab something for people to, to, to latch on to as to why France might just show up and play in a way think, that what, threatens what, England. What was the last time France played in Twickenham, I think it was 1916. Mm. Time before that, I think it was maybe 55, 35 during the year. Yes. Ireland won the, uh, the Grand Slam. And the time before that, maybe there was only eight or ten points in it again. Mm. And I was looking at roughly the average of the spread has been about 10, 11 points away from home. So if you're looking at that, the 13 does cover it. But at the same time, with their form last week versus England's form, you know, in the Aviva, it's going to be hard to be getting, you know, on that uh, plus 13. Too earliest for us just yet in, in terms of getting the, the full team information through. But you look at the, again at the depth that England have. So Itoje is gone. We know that. The ability to, to decide whether they're going to go with Launchbury or, or, or Courtney Laws. I yeah. mean, and, and, and big physical men who are just going to try and squeeze, you think, France again? Yeah. Squeeze the yeah. life out of this game? France don't, have, don't exactly have the smallest, but they, they had the, what, the, the world's heaviest uh, scrum that was fielded That's last right. weekend. Yeah. Um, but, but, but not the same athleticism. No, yeah, and uh, I think that maybe goes back to my point of the lack of professionalism maybe at club level because that's, you know, that's your bread and butter. That's where you're going to be doing your most of your conditioning and that kind of stuff. 
Um, look, it, it could be one of the ones where France decide to step up, and it's just a matter of if they're going to step up. But to be safe, I think that uh, the minus thirteen might be the bet. Okay, yeah. let's let's just though have a have a word on, on on where England have been, where they are now, and where you think they might be come World Cup time. Would that have against Ireland make you sit up and say? it was a once-off and they need to back it up? Or that's enough for me to say with the prep, the three or the two and a half months together before the World Cup and with the mindset right, that they are now proper contenders? Yeah, I think um, last weekend, I suppose, was maybe a bit of that glimpse that when they went on the, what was it, the 21-game yeah. winning streak. And that's the kind of England we expected. They went on a lull there, you know, during the last Six Nations, weren't great during summer, were... They weren't like they had some good results in November, but if you look like the last minute, you know, on Farrell shoulder charge uh, against South Africa, that should have been a penalty. And arguably, they would have lost that game. They lost to New Zealand. Um, they beat a kind of uninterested Australian team, and they struggled against Japan. Well, when I mean they struggled, they should have beaten them by a lot more. So England went through a bit of a lull, and maybe Eddie Jones got the kind of the kick in the ass that he needed, you know, to kind of get the lads back together. Um, and he's quite, he's a bit of a Joe Schmidt type character from what I've heard from the England yeah. boys. Um, so I can't see him taking, you know, this England squad and going away to the World Cup and not coming back with, you know, at least a semi-final. Hmm. Okay, okay. For the weekend ahead, where, where's the value for you? Come on, give something, give, give people something to look out for where actually they might take a little bit of money from you rather than the other way around. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say this without knowing the full squad news. Yes, of course. It. We did this super price boost last week, um, which was hugely popular. Um, and last week it cost us 20k uh, because Johnny May scored the first against Ireland. We took over 600 bets on it, um, and it's likely to be him again. He's six to one to score first, even money anytime. So I think that's going to be very popular. And of course, um, we're doing a double your odds if you're winning first try score scores a second try at any oh. time in our shops so that's going to be popular but I think we're looking at the handicap betting you said we think Wales are going to cover it is everyone in agreement with well, Wales well, 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 I think, well, think the Italians, I think the Italians will, 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 will do well they against the Welsh load better up, than that load up on pizza and pasta the night before <laughs> 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 and Scotland as well to cover that handicap betting yeah. I know you might disagree you're very much Ireland are going to win this I think Ireland I think will win it but I think it'll be tight it'll be, mm. yeah exactly I like tight. the handicap yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I, they're probably not great value at 2-1 to one, yeah. but uh, a little bit better than uh, evens right. you should probably take the points if you want to Give yourself a win. Okay, very good. <laughs> Listen, folks, uh, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the weekend ahead. The Guinness Six Nations should be absolutely fantastic. And we'll see you next time on The Breakdown in association with Labrooks.